Okay, today we're going to talk about entropy and heat engines. So entropy tends to be confusing for people, and that's, you know, because it's a brand new kind of topic, and its physical interpretation is a bit sophisticated, and a few steps removed from the simple equations where we see the entropy. Uh, we're going to ta try to avoid talking at all about its physical interpretation, and hopefully avoid some confusion. Sorry, we'll save that for another time. Um, instead, we're going to think about entropy as a sort of state function version of heat. So heat, as you know, is not a state function. It flows in and out of the system as the system changes state, but the system doesn't contain heat. Uh, entropy is the next best thing. It flows into and out of the system at the same time that heat flows, but it has the advantage of being a state function. So we're going to illustrate some of the uses of entropy in an ideal gas setting, um, some examples, some simple calculations, and hopefully avoid confusion. First, we'll review heat engines, and then we'll talk about entropy. A heat engine converts the energy in the microscopic motions of molecules into macroscopic work. As an example, consider the heat engine described by the following PV diagram. We start with an isobaric expansion during which heat flows into the gas, as can be seen by applying the first law. Next, we reduce the pressure at fixed volume, and during this process, heat flows out of the gas. Finally, we adiabatically contract back to the original state and no heat flows during this process. Since the change in internal energy for a cycle is equal to zero, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the total heat flow into the engine is equal to the total work done by the engine. This is how heat engines convert microscopic energy into macroscopic work. We can compute the work done by the engine by using the integral of PDV formula. The work done on the gas is indicated by the area under the green curve, while the work done by the gas is indicated by the area under the red curve. We see that there is an excess of work done by the gas, that excess given by the shaded red area. Thus, the total net work and the net heat flow are positive. Conservation of energy tells us that the total amount of energy going into the system should equal the total amount of energy coming out of the system. Energy comes out of the system either through macroscopic work done or through heat flow out of the system. We can write the net heat flow as consisting of two pieces, a total heat flow into the system and a total heat flow out of the system, the net being the difference between these two. From here we see that indeed the total heat flow into the system is equal to the net work done plus the heat flow out. The fact that there is waste heat flow out of the system is an important thing to realize about heat engines. When we power the system, we supply some amount of heat in, and what we get out is work, which is what we wanted, and some unusable waste energy, Q out. The efficiency of the engine is defined as the net work divided by the amount of heat we put in. Using the above equation, we can rewrite this as 1 minus Q out divided by Q in. We'll have a lot more to say about efficiency later. But for now, notice that this number is always less than 1. There is a special type of engine which is the most efficient possible, and that is the Carnot engine. The secret to the Carnot engine is that all of the heat exchange happens at the extreme temperatures. Consider first our engine from before. This particular heat engine reaches its highest temperature in the upper right corner of the cycle and its lowest temperature in the lower right corner of the cycle. Heat flow occurs along the red and blue lines while the system is transitioning between two temperatures. The PV diagram of a Carnot engine consists of an isotherm at the hot temperature, followed by an adiabatic transition to the cold temperature, another isotherm at the cold temperature, and an adiabatic transition back to the hot temperature. Heat flow into the Carnot engine occurs only at the hottest temperature, and heat flow out of the Carnot engine occurs only at the coldest temperature and not during any temperature transitions. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, the efficiency of the Carnot engine is given by 1 minus T cold divided by T hot, and this is the best you can do for any engine operating between the same two extreme temperatures. Now we're ready to talk about entropy. The first and most important fact about entropy is that it is a state function. That means that if I transition from a state A to a state B, the change in entropy of my system is equal to the entropy at B minus the entropy at A, independent of path. The second fact is that the total combined entropy of both the system and the environment with which it exchanges heat remains unchanged in a reversible process. So if the transition from A to B is reversible, 
then the entropy change of the environment is equal to minus the entropy change of the system. This is only true for reversible processes. In an irreversible process, the total entropy will increase. These rules about the change in total entropy comprise the second law of thermodynamics, which is true for all systems and all processes. Now let's talk about computing the entropy change for the system in a reversible process. Entropy changes when heat flows into or out of the system, and the rule is that delta S equals the integral of dQ over T. Let's apply this rule to the various ideal gas transformations that we're familiar with. In the isothermal case, T is constant and can be pulled out of the integral. We're left with the integral of dQ, and the integral of dQ is just Q, the total heat flow. In the adiabatic case, there is no heat flow, and since there's no heat flow, there's no entropy change, delta S equals zero. For an isochoric, or constant volume process, we have to be a little more careful. Since work is equal to zero, Q is equal to delta E, which is the same as D over two, D being the number of degrees of freedom, times the change in PV. Of course, volume is constant, so the change in PV is equal to V times the change in P. Now we're going to make some substitutions and write this dQ integral as a dP integral. Our first substitution is to replace one over T by NK over PV. That's just the ideal gas law. Now we're going to make a substitution for dQ. dQ should be thought of as an infinitesimal heat flow. We already have a formula at the top which relates a finite heat flow to a finite pressure change. The infinitesimal form of that equation is dQ equals d over 2 times V dP, and we can use that to substitute in for dQ. Now we just have to pull out all of our constants, and we get an integral of dP over P. This integral is easily evaluated to yield a formula for the change in entropy in an isochoric process. The isobaric case is very similar. We start with the first law of thermodynamics specialized to isobaric processes, and then rewrite everything in terms of the change in volume. This gives us a relationship between an infinitesimal addition of heat, dQ, and an infinitesimal change in volume, namely dQ is equal to quantity 1 plus d over 2 times P dV. After substituting this and the ideal gas law into the integral for delta S, we can turn it into an integral over V. This integral is also easy to perform, and we get a formula for the change in entropy in an isobaric process. Since entropy is a state function, the change in entropy along any path is equal to the change in entropy of an isochoric process followed by an isobaric process, which connect the same two states. This simple fact allows us to write a very general formula for the change in entropy between any two states. Namely, we just have to sum the change in entropy for the isobaric process and the change in entropy for the isochoric process, which connect those two states. The formula can be written in many equivalent ways. When we first write it down, it's in terms of the initial and final pressures and volumes, but some simple algebra allows us to write it in terms of the initial and final temperatures and the initial and final volumes. No matter how you choose to write it, the nice thing about this formula is that it only depends on the initial and final points. It makes no mention of the path you took to get there. This formula is even useful for irreversible processes which don't even have trajectories on the PV plane. For those processes, it's impossible to use the integral of dQ over T to find the change in entropy because there's no path to integrate over. However, this formula will still work, provided that you know the initial and final states. Now let's return to the Carnot engine and analyze it using entropy. We can write the change in entropy for the system over one complete cycle as the difference between delta S in and delta S out. Since entropy is a state function, this difference must be zero. Delta S in consists of all the positive contributions to entropy change coming from heat flowing into the system. Likewise, delta S out consists of all the negative contributions coming from heat leaving the system. All of the heat flow into the system occurs along the hot isotherm, so we can immediately write delta S in equals Q in divided by T hot. Since total entropy change equals zero, delta S in equals delta S out. And by similar logic as before, delta S out equals Q out divided by T cold. Thus we have an equation relating Q in, Q out, TH, and TC. We can now apply this equation to the formula for the efficiency of a heat engine to derive the Carnot efficiency, which we mentioned before. 
The key here was that entropy is a state function, and all the heat exchange happens on isotherms. As a final demonstration, let's see what we can say for the case of a general reversible heat engine. In general, we would represent delta S in as an integral over those parts of the cycle during which heat flows into the system. Since the temperature of the system is always less than or equal to Th, we can say that this integral is always bigger than or equal to Q in over Th. A similar logic says that delta S out is always less than or equal to Q out divided by Tc. Since delta S in equals delta S out, we can follow these inequalities to say that Q out over Q in is always at least as big as Tc over Th. We can now apply this inequality to the efficiency formula for a heat engine and conclude that for a general reversible heat engine, the efficiency is always less than or equal to the Carnot efficiency. Are you confused yet?